Well, here we are. It is Monday, April 1st, 2024. And uh, this is the video I was talking about doing a couple of weeks ago. I mentioned there was a sale coming up at Christie's that uh, that somebody at Christie's had mentioned to me because it had some really great Chinese things in it. And I want to go through those, but I also want to talk about the auction itself because it's it, it, when you when you look at antiques and objects in, in the in sort of the broader window, so to speak, of human, human existence, um, you're going to find some interesting similarities but, but behind what was going on in the arts in France and in Europe at the time and what was going on at China at the same basic time. It was, it's a very sort of interesting uh, way to look at it. And it's a way to appreciate how much the world was changing at that time. We often think of China as being in a capsule and dealing with the West through the trade. And we often think of the French and doing their business. But we don't often see the parallels, the cultural parallels that were going on during the, the 18th century in particular and other periods. But the 18th century is the focus of this and it's called the Park Avenue collection and what's in this sale is is predominantly furniture and furnishings dating to the period of Louis the 15th and Louis the 16th now Louis the 15th was the great grandson of Louis the 14th and he was never supposed to be the emperor this is the sort of interesting thing about it he, he it was supposed to go to, to to uncles and other members of the family but they all died and and throughout his life death pay, played a huge role in in determining um, Louis XV's uh, uh, future. Um, his wife died. He had a son that died. Uh, disease was a huge problem back then, and uh, people people died suddenly um, um, for for you know reasons that they were unable to treat, uh, and, and it just sort of went along. But I want to talk about some of the furniture and furnishings in here, and a little bit about how the the what was going on in China. Um, during the 17th and 18th century and how they were evolving. The Qing dynasty was growing. It was become a period of, of extreme economic success uh, during the Qinlong period, especially Yongzhen and Qinlong period, where they were, they were, they were, the, the country was at peace, had been at peace for 70 or 80 years. It was very, very prosperous. Trade was good. There was a lot of wealth being generated for the, uh, for the, for the imperial family. And just like France, there was a lot of wealth being created for the French royal family and, and, and their successors. So they were all moving along sort of a similar timeline um, um, into, the, into the future, but appreciating the objects um, that were being produced in each place. I'm, I'm going to get into them a little bit, but it's sort of, it, it's a, it's a sort of an interesting intermingling um, of cultures. And I think, I think that's always the best way to collect by having things from different cultures and different, different histories merging together um, um, uh, to, be, to be viewed in that perspective of the time period from which they came. All right, but the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the Chinese things. Then I'm going to get into some of the French furniture and whatnot. And I hope you stick around for it because it is interesting. All right, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is this jar. Uh, this is a really unusual jar. It's a hundred boys jar, has a Wanli mark on the bottom, and it's estimated at just seven to nine thousand dollars, which makes me wonder what's wrong with it. Uh, because the top of it, you'll notice, has here are the boys, they're wonderfully painted, but at the top there's this sort of um, uh, trans, translucent aubergine underglaze or overglaze. I can't really tell from the pictures, but I, I, you need if, if you're interested in this jar, find out if that's original. Uh, because if that's that's original to this, this is a, an incredibly rare piece of porcelain. Um, and I think the estimate is remarkably low. Now, it may have been restored. There may have been a restoration at the top of this jar, and they added that color um, um, you know, just to add, add color. I'm not sure. But um, I, you, you want to find out if that's, that is original because it's, it's certainly unusual. All right. And the jar is only estimated at seven to $9,000 for a Mackin period Wanli jar with unusual decoration. It measures uh, 12, 12 and a quarter inches tall. Uh, but I would check that out. I would definitely look into that and find out about that upper section. Because if it, if it is original, uh, th this, is a, this is a $30 to $50,000 porcelain, I think. Maybe more. Um, and then there's this, the Kangxi period Bombay form um, Immortals uh, incense burner. This is a nice one, and it's a well-known type, but it's particularly well potted. The shaping of the of the porcelain is exceptional. Very strong curvature on the body, uh, beautifully glazed, beautifully decorated, um, perfectly potted, very symmetrical, nice and even across the top. Three to five thousand dollar estimate. It's ten inches in diameter. 
It's a nice piece of porcelain. And here you have an immortal opening up the, uh, the one of the bottles and the cloud is coming out. And, you know, the, the, the idea is that somewhere in this cloud, something mythical will appear. Sometimes it's a floating castle. Other times it's descending cranes. Uh, it could be any number of things being brought in. So you're, it leaves, it's left open to your imagination, I guess. And then over to this, the Kangxi period uh, brush pot. It is marked on the bottom with a simple Buddha swastika device on the base, but it's beautifully painted, estimated at twenty to 30000 And there are two Kangxi brush pots in this sale. There's another one that's estimated. It's not quite as uh, quite as good as this one, and it's estimated in, in, in uh, six to 8000 or something like that. But this is a particularly nice one. It's very strongly potted, nice width to it. Um, it measures seven and a half inches in diameter. It's it's a, a very nice piece of porcelain. And I think it will get there. I think the, the prices of these brush pots lately has been quite good. And then this, another piece of, you're going to see there's a lot of Kangxi and a lot of late Ming pieces in here and, and some and mid-18th century pieces. And then you have this, this very lovely pair of tall uh, Kangxi period jars uh, with battle scenes on them uh, and done in Femi Ver. Uh, this, these are 22 inches tall, very big. For these and it's a pair you don't see pairs of these too often in this style uh, i think in this size i think they're really quite wonderful i think the enameling on them is very very good um all the secondary elements look great on it uh, they've provided a number of photographs of it going through they don't show a picture of the bottom so i assume there's nothing really on it it's probably just a, a, a maybe has a circle but probably has nothing it's left blank because these big pieces once they get over 20 20 inches they're not they generally aren't marked as a rule, um, they don't, they didn't put marks on them. Uh, certainly not Kangxi marks or anything like that. And then over to this another Wanli jar, and this is a very unusual jar. It is mark in period. It is uh, 14 inches, uh, 14 and a half inches tall. Um, here, here's a picture of the mark. It's on the bottom. There's a nice clear shot of the bottom of this, by the way. If you're a Wan Lee fan, you can come over and see it. And uh, this style of this this foot done in this way and the coloring and so forth makes me think this is probably an earlier Wan Lee piece rather than a later when they got rather rustic and sort of crude at times. Um, the early Wan Lee pieces were, were closer to pieces that you would see coming out of the Jiajing period. And this is a really unusual one because there's this, this whole uh, rookery of birds which which you don't see very often and it's just pine trees just covered with birds coming and with clouds in the background and all these birds and magpies or whatever they are are descending all over this bush so it's quite an active scene and it's a scene you do see i mean it, it, you know in the spring when the birds arrive if you live in a migrate migrate migratory area you'll see gaggles of birds we see them here behind the house all the time when they come through uh, s s starlings we had we had a whole army of robins that came through a few weeks ago and here you have it depicted on a chinese porcelain and it was probably obviously taken from nature is something a phenomenon that they see there when the birds are migrating coming through and but very unusual subject matter um for a wanli jar very very unusual estimated at 20 to thirty thousand dollars seems reasonable mark and period 14 inches tall and then over to this the transitional period early kung shunji period uh, 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 jar, uh, nicely done, Femi Ver enamels, um, or Wutsai enamels. Uh, the figures are b beautifully detailed. I don't see a lot of wear to it anywhere. It looks to be in pretty good shape. There's a brief hairline here at the rim, but overall, it's a nice looking pot, beautifully shaped, beautifully formed, uh, measures 10, 10 inches in diameter, so it's good size with just a two to $3,000 estimate on it. So if you're interested in that, get an S get get a condition report on it. I suspect it's in good condition because uh, all the porcelains in the sale so far look like they're in pretty good shape, with the exception of the question on that first Wanli uh, pot. I, I, you want to find out about that. And then you have over to this this uh, 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 Thai market um, Daoguan market period bowl. Um, very interesting, seven inches in diameter, estimated at eight to twelve thousand dollars. If you're if you're if you're a Daoguan fan, this might be something you'd want to look into. The same pattern you'll also find if if some of you have seen it before. Remember, they, they this pattern first appeared really in the Kangxi period on blue and white pieces, and uh, and it was it was continued on and then brought back in the Daoguan period apparently. 
All right, and then over to this. This is one of my favorite things of the sale. It's not certainly the most expensive, but it's an awfully, awfully attractive box. It is Kung Shi period. Um, uh, beautifully colored, though. I love the coloring on this. I love the, the fact that they used a, a white background on the sides and a blue background on the top, and then they sort of just, you know, outlined everything in blue to make the white produce the image. Very, very clever decoration. A little bit of fritting along the edge, of course. Very common on Kangxi porcelains. It's, it's almost unavoidable at times, especially when they had pieces with fairly sharp ridges on them. They tended to, to blister off, but very nicely decorated. A uh, beautiful piece of porcelain, six to $8,000. It measures six and three quarter inches in diameter. So it's almost seven inches wide. That's a pretty good sized box. And I think it's a very unusual box. Um, if you look around, I don't think you're going to find other other similar examples very, very easily. Um, let's see here. The Providence on it came from the, the Bloxham collection um, that was ended and closed out in 1928. And it was offered from the Gruber collection in 1986. That's the other thing I noticed about this sale was a, 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 the vast majority of this, the contents of the sale, both the Chinese objects and the, the French furniture, the decorative accessories, all were bought based more or less prior to 1999. Most of it was bought, seems to have been bought in the 1980s. So it's been off the market for a good long time, 40, 50 years. Sounds like they're closing out an apartment or something's happening. But uh, somebody's going through a big life change, I think, is what this is. Because this is obviously a lifelong collection. And then you have this, this very unusual, really unusual, um, 18th century Famille Rose moon flask with monkeys on one side and... Um, Hold on a second. This is the bottom. And de spotted deer on the other side with ascending birds. Uh, this is a really interesting piece of porcelain. And uh, uh, I can't think of one that I've seen quite like it, actually. I've seen bowls with similar decorations on it, but never a, 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 a Bianu or moon flask. And it's estimated at thirty to 50000 It is not signed, but it is 18th century. And it measures uh, 13 and a half inches, 13 and a quarter inches in height. So it's a good size flask. It's not a you know five or six inch one, but look at the decoration. It's very striking. Love the monkeys. Love the monkeys. This one's sort of timidly climbing up. The other one is trying to entice the younger monkey off the branch because he's you know he's in danger. All right, I'm back. So this wonderful moon flask um, with the monkeys on it. Uh, very and very unusual. And again, it may be one of those situations where it's atypical and people are going to look at it that, that are buying and saying, well, I don't know what it's really worth. They have to, unless they can find a, a comparable example upon which to base a price. So it could be the chance to buy something incredibly interesting and rare um, for, you know, 30 to 50,000 or maybe 20,000. You don't know. You don't know, but it's a great looking thing. Great looking thing. And then you get into the furniture. And this is the interesting part. These are the, these were, this is a, a Louis the 15th Ormolu mounted tulip wood bureau plot. And uh, th this style of furniture uh, became very, very popular sort of during the second er second period of Louis the 15th reign because he ascended, he became emperor at the age of five, but he didn't become coronated um, until he was uh, 13 or 14, 13 years old. And at that point, up until then, he had a regent, and furniture styles didn't change much, but Louis the, the 15th had very interesting uh, tastes. He had lots of mistresses, as, as, you know, Madame Pompadour, and then later Madame du Barry, and other people. Uh, he was a busy guy. And um, the, he, he, he took about, it's sort of interesting in the day, that these pieces of furniture that were built, these very ornate, incredibly ornate marquetry and inlaid tables and bits of furniture with cast and gilt bronzes, were not made for big rooms. These were made for intimate quarters. These were made for small rooms, the, 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 the Trianon, uh, the, the Pity Palace, these, these little places that he was a big fan of uh, having built. And um, he had the grand rooms, the Versailles and all that, but he spent most of his time uh, puttering around in smaller uh, 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 residences. And um, uh, this is the kind of furniture that he, he was uh, inclined to like. Uh, the, the Louis the Fourteenth furniture was much bigger case pieces, not nearly as elaborate. The the, the, the furniture that was made during his grandfather's reign, and uh, he became a big fan of ormolu mounts, very very fancy stuff. And this is the, some of the material that they made. And all of these pieces were made in famous ateliers, made by in famous studios um, uh, that worked uh, expressly for the King of France. 
and uh, they would they would have workshops going day and night making furniture. In his case, when in, he was in the process of building multiple homes, multiple residences, residences for his mistresses, residences for his family members, and one thing or another, and then custom furniture and furnishings like this with these in, incredibly fine inlaid pieces. And the, these the, they had uh, ebonists that would produce the the, the basic case form um, that were free of nails free of glue, and then they would send it off to be veneered and decorated, and then at that point they would introduce glue and so forth. But prior to that, all of the joinery on these pieces, like Chinese furniture, were just pins. It was just pinned and really fine cabinet making. So it was, it was, a, it was a trend here. You have a thing where it was, a, it was how they made furniture in China, and it was also how they made furniture in France. For the for the for the, uh, for the for the upper classes, and then and this is a, a beautiful piece of furniture. It's estimated at forty to sixty thousand dollars by Jacques Dubois. It was made around 1745, sort of at the very very beginning of what's what's known as the the, the true Louis the the fifteenth style, uh, right around that time period. So it's 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 one of the one of the early pieces. And then there's this. Now this is interesting because this was designed by uh, Giancondo um, Albertoli, who was a Milanese cabinet maker, but had heavy influence um, um, by, by the French workmen, French work, obviously. And uh, he was a very, very famous designer in Italy. Um, he, he was he got awards from Napoleon. Uh, he, he was famous for paintings. He had, he had a, he was a connoisseur of the arts, and he was an amazing furniture designer. And this is uh, one of the tables that he had designed. And and the interesting thing about him, he lived to be almost 100. He lived to be 96 years old, which was pretty amazing in the 18th century. And uh, this was one of the tables that was attributed to his workshop. Um, after, uh, uh, it, it, it was done in the Giovanni Gorla workshop after a design by Giocondo Albertoli, and, uh, it, it, who was working in Milan at the time. And this was made around 1800, they estimate. So it was just, a, it was just coming on sort of at the, at, at the beginning of the Louis XVI period. Because a lot of the furniture in here is also Louis the Sixteenth, and there, there's not a, an enormous change or shift between Lu, the Louis the Sixteenth, Louis the Fifteenth, and Louis the Sixteenth. There, there, there's certain uh, pieces that are at times very difficult to, to differentiate um, if you look at them quickly. And then you had beautiful things like this, these fo these fauteuils. Um, these are wonderful. A, a fauteuil is just an open armchair. Um, uh, if it has a closed arm on it with fabric over it, it, it it's called a bergere. And if it has an open arm, it's called a fauteuil. That's the, the only difference. And these are all beautifully carved gilt wood uh, 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 frames with uh, fantastic looking 19th century French tapestries on them. Probably 19th century, unless they're very expensive custom pieces. Um, estimated at twenty to 30000 for the four chairs or around, you know, four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 per chair. Uh, made at the, again at the at the, sort of the early early phases of of of, of, of the true Louis the, the fully matured Louis the Fifteenth style, and then you have this. Now this is Louis the Sixteenth, and as I said, they're pretty similar in um, in, in appearance um, in in many ways. Lots of uh, beautiful woodwork. Um, this is a cylinder desk, which means that this whole front of the de the, the desk here is 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 composed of a solid block of wood that's been steam bent. And this will re revolve back up into the body, give, revealing a, a, a writing space. And th there it is. It's got pull-out slides on the side. And here th here's the interior, all fitted with little drawers, uh, paper drawers, ink drawers, and so forth, leaving notes. Not too dissimilar from what you'd want from a desk today, really, except that you probably have a laptop on it, and they didn't have those. Uh, but at any rate, it's a, it's a wonderful-looking cylinder desk. Beautifully done um, at the end of the uh, 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 sort of it was done by they said this was done by Adam Weisweiler um, between 1785 and 1790. So that would have been, again, Louis the 16th period. OK, and then over to this, you have this really nice um, late Louis the 15th ormolu mounted Kingwood tulip wood, tulip wood and amaranth parquetry commode. And uh, if you don't know what amaranth is, it's 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 like like in China where zitan wood was so popular, it was a purple wood. Well, amaranth is a purple wood that the French were importing from Brazil at the time, and it it, it was it was a color that they the market the, the inlaid marquetry people really liked to work with because it gave a strong contrast and it, it bloomed like like um, a zitan. Into once air hit it and it was refinished, it developed beautiful color. 
this beautiful purplish tone, the striations in it. And, and the French cabinet makers, like the Chinese um, uh, uh, carvers, loved um, uh, amaranth. And um, they used it a lot. And you will see the word amaranth on a lot of pieces um, uh, that were made especially during the, the, the middle of the, uh, well, the, 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 the mid 18th century onward um, under Louis the, Louis the 15th and Louis the 16th. And uh, this is the chest. And if you look at the amount of work that went into this thing, the phenomenal inlays, just phenomenal. Those little tiny, they're like toothpicks, uh, extremely fine workmanship all the way around, you know, hand gilt bronzes, and, and hand, hand cast bronze rather and then gilded and then this beautiful pudding stone top and uh, again um, if you think about in the 18th century in China during the Qinlong period um, what were they making in porcelain they were doing the um, uh, the Trump Loy uh, porcelains emulating pudding stone uh, so pudding stone was a popular uh, visual uh, image uh, not only in China at the time but also in France because you find it often on French furniture it was considered to be, you know, a very, very uh, luxurious type of stone. And here, this very nice uh, a, a chest, estimated at twelve to eighteen thousand U.S. dollars. And then over to this is another ormolu mounted. This is Louis the Sixteenth um, amaranth and uh, mounted tulip wood marquetry and so forth. This demi lude commode, uh, beautifully done with a green marble top, moss green marble. Uh, with a pictorial panel in the center, all done with marquetry, all done with marquetry, individually cut. And again, you have this extremely fine um, inlay uh, technique that they were able to do. Um, ex uh, fantastically fussy, took forever to make these. And again, it was it was part of a reflection of the era where, it, like in China, they were doing luxurious things in the court of, uh, of, of Yongchen and Qinlong, well, the end of the Kangxi period, Yongchen and Qinlong. And in France, um, the end of Louis the 14th reign going into Louis the 15th Louis the 16th and again um, enormous pro enormously prosperous time lots of wealth and money was being spent on the arts and uh, he, he was a, a huge fan of the arts himself a big patron he, he employed hundreds of workmen um, doing everything from making furniture to savonnery carpets to, to tapestries to a, a, a spectacular interior architectural elements columns and so forth and if you if you've been to Paris and, and, and seen what they what they built during this time it is quite phenomenal and certainly you know it, it certainly could be viewed on as being on a par with what they would do or similar to what they were doing in China at the same time among the the, the elite leading classes in that country um, the same sort of things were going on in France human nature is human nature and they were also doing things like this, this absolutely beautiful Parisian porcelain a pair of um, a, a gold ground campana, a companion uh, vases, urns, classical urns, and, and very French style. They have, uh, they have pictorial images of humble farmers and people working the land and so forth, which was very popular subject matter, and, uh, but beautifully made porcelain. Um, and you, you have to you have to look at this and realize that the Europeans didn't come along making porcelain until just, you know, uh, 100 years before this. Um, they were not long into the porcelain world and they were already producing exemplary pieces like this um, where the Chinese have been making it since the ninth century. So it's, it's a very interesting thing of how quickly they caught up. These were made around 1825. They're estimated at two to three thousand dollars. And, and, and you should go through I, that's I, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to go through every lot in the sale. It's a very interesting auction. Um, as you can see, there's a, lots of Chinese material in here. There's some wonderful portraits, lots of decorative accessories, things that you, you, you might like. Um, and, and, you know, they did they did amazingly great work in uh, France, just like they did in China. Uh, and it all comes together beautifully. It all works together beautifully, elegantly and uh that's all I really have to say on it. It's just an interesting sale. I hope you check it out. Uh, there is a downloadable PDF file here. You can download the catalog onto your phone if you want to see, you want to carry it around and read it a little bit. It's very informative, and uh, there's a very interesting range of um, uh, furnishings and furniture in here, uh, from top to bottom. No no carpets to speak of, but but they have everything else. So I think it, I think it's a great lots of paintings, lots of great paintings. So check it out. All right. So that's about it. Have a good rest of your uh, week here. We'll be back uh, later on in the week with something else. And uh, see you again soon. Bye-bye.